Janet Yellen says America can afford to financially support two wars. Meanwhile, most Americans can't afford to financially support two labradoodles. California will issue ebony alerts for missing black children. This just might be the most shrill virtue signal ever. And Biden is restarting construction on the border wall after saying he wouldn't. Guess the only thing he won't try to build back better is his reputation. That and more on this week's headlines. Welcome to America Uncovered. I'm Matt Ganesta, filling in today for Chris Chapel. I'll try to speak up so you can hear me over the sound of my mustache. So according to a report from the American Security Project, nearly 70% of active service members in the US military fall within the overweight or obese range of the body mass index. Does this mean they're gonna make an obese Top Gun remake? I got the need, the need to feed. The military is having a hard time finding recruits. So to increase their numbers, they're lowering their standards. The Army is opening doors to recruits who fail to meet initial body fat standards and academic standards. It's also reducing physical fitness standards for women and older soldiers. While this is embarrassing, at least the Army can keep its original slogan, be all you can be. These problems are being seen as a security risk. The American Security Project report points out that obesity is an epidemic. It says the growing prevalence of obesity in service members reduces the readiness of the all-volunteer military, but it isn't a moral failing, it's a health crisis. And there's controversy over using body mass index as an indicator of obesity since it doesn't take things like muscle mass or bone density into account. I agree, there are much better methods to determine how fat someone is. Things I've known about since elementary school when people called me Matt the fat. You can just measure someone's fatness based on whether their blood type is Rocky Road. And if when they sit around the house, they sit around the house. Yo mama knows what I'm talking about. Speaking of the US military, the Pentagon put about 2,000 troops on notice to prepare to deploy to Israel to assist with advising and medical support. And President Biden traveled to Israel to meet with Israeli leaders amid concerns that the Israel-Hamas war could expand. Biden had planned to travel to Jordan too, but that trip was called off due in part to a period of mourning announced by President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority after an explosion at a Gaza hospital parking structure killed at least 500 people, according to the Ministry of Health in Gaza. Israel initially blamed the explosion on a failed rocket launch by Hamas, while Hamas blamed it on an intentional airstrike from Israel. US intel then suggested that Israel would have been incredibly stupid to have done that on purpose. They believe the attack was launched by an Islamic militant group, but one that's a rival to Hamas. Now, I don't mean to be a Karen about this, but if reality has a manager, I'd like to speak to them and request to be in another one where war crimes aren't Spider-Man memes. After returning from Israel, Biden delivered a rare primetime address to the nation, where he said that the US holds the world together and that aid for Israel and Ukraine is a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations, which comes at a time when major banks are struggling to pay dividends to American bank accounts. A lot of people are wondering if the US can really afford to financially support both conflicts. Well, Treasury Secretary Jenny Yellen claims the US can, saying America can certainly afford to stand with Israel and to support Israel's military needs, and we also can and must support Ukraine in its struggle against Russia. President Biden agreed. We're the United States of America, for God's sake. The most powerful nation in the history, not in the world, in the history of the world. The history of the world. We can take care of both of these and still maintain our overall international defense. Okay, is it just me, or does this sound like a guy on a first date bragging how rich he is and how he can totally take care of her? But then when he takes her back to his messy apartment, she sees he's got a bunch of roommates who argue constantly and can't even make any decisions because they're fighting over who gets to speak for all of them. Oh, this is like the most dramatic sugar daddy ever. Thousands of American citizens are trapped in Israel, but they're beginning to receive assistance in coming home. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis welcomed nearly 300 citizens flown from Israel into Tampa airport. This was facilitated by the search and rescue nonprofit project, Dynamo. There was a devoid of leadership, so we stepped up and led. Uh, we're happy to be able to deliver this, so we're getting ready to welcome them back to the United States of America. This really sheds light on how bad the situation is. These civilians caught in this conflict see Florida as their salvation. 
You know things are bleak when you see a place where a teacher traumatized their fourth grade students by playing an R-rated Winnie the Pooh horror movie, and you still think, ah, finally someplace sane. Over 300 people were arrested for gathering at the U.S. Capitol complex to protest against Israel. Protesting inside the Capitol? So clearly this was an insurrection, right? Well, ABC News and several other mainstream media outlets were quick to point out that protesters are legally allowed to enter the Capitol complex, and the only reason they got arrested is because they were creating a disturbance. Just like how they explained the January 6th protests weren't an insurrection in this footage here. Hmm, that's odd. And after the break, California unveils the Ebony Alert. Welcome back. My great home state of California became the first in the U.S. to pass an ebony alert law, which will allow law enforcement to send a special alert to help find missing black children. Which may be a noble idea, but did they have to go with that name? You know Amber Alert comes from the name of a missing child, not the color Amber. Ebony Alert sounds like what a racist posts on the next door app when a black family moves into the neighborhood. California State Senator Stephen Bradford, who created the bill, says data shows that black and brown are indigenous brothers and sisters. When they go missing, there's very rarely the type of media attention, let alone amber alerts and police resources that we see with our white counterparts. To be clear, this ebony alert is just for missing black children, not missing indigenous children. Maybe they'll come up with one for them too. I just hope they don't call it a red alert. But Senator Bradford's statement is not actually um, accurate. Missing black children receive Amber Alerts at about the same rate as missing white children, even though white children are more likely to be returned to their parents. As a matter of fact, some question the effectiveness of Amber Alerts in general. A study from USA Today shows that while they can help retrieve missing children, it rarely prevents harm from coming to them when that's the goal of their captors. And a criminal justice professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, says there's just not a lot of reason to believe that when there's an Amber Alert success, it's successfully rescuing children from threatening situations. Thus, I strongly suspect that that would be the experience of any implemented Ebony Alert in California. So he's saying he doesn't think it'll be very effective. Though, to be fair, that can be said for just about any law passed in California these days. Speaking of things that won't be successful, the U.S. eased oil sanctions on Venezuela after reaching a deal with President Nicolas Maduro. In exchange, Maduro promised that he would allow banned opponents to run against him in an election next year. You know, the U.S. sure is quick to make deals with an authoritarian dictator. I'm sure this has nothing to do with the fact that gas got way more expensive over the summer. And even though prices have begun to fall, that may not last long. And the Biden administration sold off nearly half the nation's strategic petroleum reserve last year to address rising gas prices after Russia invaded Ukraine. Nope, nothing to do with any of that. Probably just a coincidence, like when a cheesecake goes missing and I get caught with blueberries in my mustache. Just a coinkydink. According to the Washington Post, the U.S. is likely to put a time limit on any sanctions relief so that it could be reversed if Maduro didn't comply with his end of the deal. Aw, how cute. They said if instead of when. I remember when I was that gullible. I mean, er, optimistic. But hey, I'm sure we can trust the authoritarian who ran an election most of the world saw as fraudulent to run a fair and open one this time. This is like making a deal with an anteater to not eat ants. What, you don't trust them just because they eat so many ants? It's literally their name? Judgmental much? And after the break, President Biden joins Truth Social. Welcome back. President Biden's re-election campaign has joined Donald Trump's Truth Social platform. In their first post on Truth Social, they wrote, Well, let's see how this goes. Converts welcome. Brilliant. This is like Mormons trying to convert people by opening a lemonade stand inside a strip club. Let me know how that works out for you. So why did they do it? Because they thought it would be very funny. So they're just trolls, which might actually be a good strategy, because as Donald Trump proved in 2016, you can troll your way directly to the White House. And when I say Donald Trump's a troll, I'm of course referring to his fluffy hair, and also the giant jewel he keeps in his belly button. Speaking of Biden, the Biden administration announced it will resume construction on a piece of the southern border wall in Texas, despite Biden's campaign promise that he would stop construction. 
The decision has many feeling betrayed. But to be fair, at this point, if you trust anything a politician says, that's on you. Many people are upset because they feel the border wall is ineffective. These people include Joe Biden. He said so a day after the announcement was made that construction would begin again. This is like saying masks don't work and then telling people to wear them. Oh wait, I guess that analogy was a little on the nose, unless you're wearing your mask wrong. So why is Biden's administration going through with a policy he doesn't agree with? It's because his hands are tied. Money was set aside to build the wall during Trump's presidency, and Biden says there's nothing he can do about it, explaining, money was appropriated for the border wall. I tried to get them to reappropriate to redirect the money. They didn't, they wouldn't. And in the meantime, there's nothing under the law other than they have to use the money for what is appropriated. I can't stop that. While Biden can't stop construction on the border wall, he's working to help families that were separated at the southern border. The Biden administration and the ACLU reached a court settlement that could prevent families from being separated at the border, at least for eight years. And families that were separated under the Trump administration, which includes an estimated 3,900 children, will receive temporary legal status and housing aid. According to PBS, the families in question were separated as part of a Trump-era zero-tolerance policy, where every person who crossed the border illegally would be prosecuted. And you can tell by the massive influx of immigrants since Biden took office, he uh, has a much more lenient policy. Several sanctuary cities are being overrun by illegal immigrants, and those cities are running low on resources to help them. The entire state of Massachusetts, which has a right to shelter law for immigrants, is set to reach shelter capacity by the end of this month and families could be forced onto the streets. Obviously, something needs to be done about this. But separating families at the border is seen as too extreme an act by many. And if a wall really won't work, then a possible solution is to send troops to the border. Mostly because they're so overweight, if they all stand side by side, they can make an impenetrable barrier like a giant game of Red Rover on expert mode. If you want to see how sanctuary cities are getting what they asked for and regretting it, check out this video. And YouTube does not like us, but I'm glad you do. So please click that orange button and help us out on Patreon. All it takes is a dollar an episode. Once again, I'm Matt Ganesta. Stay classy, America.